most people have heard of bulletproof coffee, I hope, and you hope. So, but I don't think a lot of people, certainly my listeners, may not know your backstory. How did all this come about? How did you go from a 300-pound college student uh, to the world's most famous biohacker? Well, I spent a million dollars and 20 years hacking my biology. And I started out not just 300 pounds. I was diagnosed from blood tests as being at high risk for a stroke and heart attack before I was 30. I had arthritis in my knees since I was 14. I've been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, a toxic mold exposure, uh, Lyme disease, and pretty much you name it. <laughs> it seemed like it was all going wrong. But the thing that scared me and really motivated me, it was two things. One, after my second knee surgery before I was 23, I said, never again, I'm gonna lose this weight, even if it kills me. I worked out an hour and a half a day, six days a week, went on a low fat, low calorie diet. And at the end of that time, I could max out all the machines in the gym and I still weighed 300 pounds. And I thought, ah, it's because I'm eating too much lettuce. You know, <laughs> it, must, it must be that. Uh, and I realized since then that 90% of how you look is what you put in your mouth and what you put in the world around you. Exercise is the other 10%. I think that's a really good point. And um, you and I obviously agree on a lot of things, and that's certainly one of them, that uh, exercise absolutely has a place, but I think we put far too much emphasis on that part and not enough em emphasis on what goes in our mouth, what goes on us, and what goes in the mouths of things we might be eating. Uh, well, I think you and I actually share an unusual distinction in that we might be at the very edge of people saying, actually, it's what you don't put in your mouth <laughs> that matters more than what you do put in your mouth, although they're both important. And, and that's uh, certainly in the whole bulletproof lifestyle from the very first day. It's like, could you stop doing the stuff that makes you weak? Because it's easier to do that than it is to do more lifting heavy things or whatever the heck. Uh, so I, kudos to you for helping that message get out there because, you know, eating bad stuff is worse than not eating good stuff. You're right. Rule number one of the plant paradox, it's, it's not what I tell you to eat that's important. It's what I tell you not to eat that's going to yeah. make the big difference. Okay. What the heck are smart <laughs> drugs? Sure. <laughs> In Game Changers, I interviewed almost 500 people who've done big things, including you, th things that are, are world-changing, leading in their categories, uh, and said, what are the commonalities? What do people agree on? And the three big buckets were people who do big things generally do things to become smarter, to become faster, and to become happier. Like They, they do big things because they're happier. They're not happy because they did big things. And it turns out that one of the ways that people do perform better is using either pharmaceuticals or plant-based compounds to improve their cognitive function. We've known about some of these for 50 plus years. They are well studied. Uh, some of them have famous movies like Limitless, roughly based on them. And I've been using them for 20 years. The idea that, that they can't work, therefore they don't, is well entrenched in Western medicine. But when you look at the studies, particularly around modafinil, one of the smart drugs that I write about in Game Changers, the studies are pretty convincing that it actually does increase cognitive performance in some domains. In my case, I had this brain fog that was really a problem, and it's gone now. When I eat the right stuff, I perform at a very high level, even for what I would have done when I was in my 20s and I'm in my 40s. But for eight years, I took modafinil. It improved my meditation practice quantitatively with EEG, it improved my relationships. I got my MBA at Wharton while working full-time at a startup. And it basically made me better at almost everything I did. I don't, I don't actually benefit much from taking it now. I, I feel a tiny bump, uh, but it's barely noticeable compared to before. It was like someone turned the lights on. So all of us can benefit. And some of these compounds actually reduce aging of the brain and of other tissues in the body. They improve performance of mitochondria, the power plants and the cells that your, uh, your viewers are no doubt familiar with. And so why aren't we all using these is my big question. You know, you're going to live to be 180. Um, At least. I don't want to put a cap on it. Okay, let's not put a cap <laughs> on it. I know we can do 120 because you and I have seen it in a few cases. So it is yeah. not impossible. It is a proven thing. And those people didn't know when they were born. They, 
I think we had the wheel back then and maybe fire. We certainly didn't have antibiotics. We didn't have public sanitation. We didn't understand mitochondria. We hadn't done the human genome project. You couldn't get a lot of the foods you can get now. Supplements weren't available. And all of the medical procedures that are available now, including heart surgery, <laughs> were totally not available back then. So if they can do it under those conditions, I'm pretty sure with conscious choice and intention and just making better decisions, not even perfect ones, 120 is eminently achievable with what we have today, assuming a truck right. doesn't hit me. Okay. So then I also am friends with the people who are leading the anti-aging research groups. I, I've been involved in that for 20 years. I know what's happening. I know what's coming. I have compounds that are under NDA that are not uh, not for human consumption that increase lifespan of rats by 95%. Am I taking those? Yeah. Uh, might they do something that we don't know about? Yeah. If I can double my lifespan, is it a good risk? <laughs> I think so. So, you know, those are the types of things that are coming. And you look at all of the machine learning, all the artificial intelligence, the fact your human genome is now free if you're willing to share your data with drug companies or a few hundred dollars, if not, you know what? I'm pretty sure we're going to get 50% over the next 100 years. In fact, I think it's it's a very conservative number. Uh, the the first person to live a thousand years is probably walking the earth today. Now, the naysayers uh, would say, why would anybody want to do that? Having spent so much time with vibrant, passionate older people, my picture of aging is different than what most people watching us today are, are thinking about. When someone says old, you immediately imagine the stoop shoulders, the walker, tubes, monitors, wheelchairs, diapers, not remembering your own name. Like it is, it is a dark place, right? Being alone in an, in an aging home. That's actually not what happened throughout all of history, except for about the last 50 years. What aging looks like is being functional, productive, having family around you, and being in a position to give back. The village elder is what's missing. The reason we do so many stupid things today is we aren't benefiting from the wisdom of our elders. And there's a couple of things going on there. One is your odds of dying from Alzheimer's disease are pretty darn good. And if you're not dead from it, you spend 20 years not remembering the wisdom that you could have shared. <laughs> um, another one is you know, people just don't have enough energy to want to give back. I'm too tired. My body hurts all the time. You know, I have cranky. You know, what's that movie? Grumpy old men syndrome. Yeah, grumpy but old man. It's, yeah. It's testosterone deficiency. We can fix that. Right. So you, you keep going into these things and you realize, wait a minute, do I get enormous benefit? I, I, I have at least, at least 10 friends over 70. And you know what? They have steered me around so many problems that I would hit in my 40s that I didn't, I don't know about them because I haven't done them yet. Well, the world needs a lot more of that if we're going to survive as a world. All right. No, you're right. The, the village elder has, has basically disappeared. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of uh, books I've read on philosophy of aging that the, the purpose of having a good old age is to actually give back your wisdom yeah. to, to those coming up behind. And I couldn't agree more that um, we've lost that. And, and like I write in The Longevity Paradox, if it's no good getting old if you can't remember it. Um, there you go. Who better to talk about success than you? I mean, you've been named Time Magazine's top 100 most influential people. Uh, two years into building the Huffington Post, I was the divorced mother of two teenage daughters. And I had bought into the collective delusion that in order to succeed, you have to be always on. You don't have time to sleep, to take care of yourself. And I collapsed. I literally hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone. And that was the beginning of my studying all the latest science, because I'm a nerd like you, <laughs> and realizing that, in fact, all the new scientific findings make it clear that when you take care of yourself, your performance and productivity improve. It's not just your health that improves, but your cognitive performance improves. So I became more and more of an evangelist, I wrote a book called Thrive. And then, because everybody wanted to talk about sleep, I wrote a book about sleep. 
And two years ago, actually, I left the Huffington Post, which was a very hard decision because it was like a third child. And it was a global media company with my name on the door, but I felt that I wanted to spend 100% of the rest of my life helping people lead lives with less stress and avoiding burnout. Because as you know, stress is so connected with disease and it is preventable. So our um, behavior change um, prescriptions are all based on what we call micro steps too small to fail. Okay, so that's, uh, give me, so it's the new year, give me an example of a micro step that you can't fail at. Great, let's say that you want to reduce your addiction to your phone and to social media and to technology, which as you know, is a growing source of stress. Yes. Because we are all increasingly addicted to this thing and we find it hard to disconnect at night to go to sleep. 72% of people sleep with their phone by their bed. So if they wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or for whatever reason, they are tempted. Even if they tell themselves, I'm not going to look at my phone, if they can't immediately go back to sleep, they go to their phone. And that, again, all the science tells us is incredibly disruptive to getting deep sleep. So um, one of my favorite micro steps, and we have like over 700, is pick a time at the end of your day that you declare the end of your working day. It's an arbitrary end to declare an end. And we declare the end by turning off our phone and charging it outside our bedroom. So that's a little step. It's a ritual, but it's very significant because you have a clear demarcation between your day life with all its challenges and problems and your night life, which should be all about recharging and reconnecting with a deeper part of ourselves. Now, you know, my, my friend Dr. McCullough would say that the other reason not to have your phone by your bed is the uh, electromagnetic waves that are constantly coming out of your phone. Right. And disrupting uh, almost every, every cellular function that we have. And you're right, sleeping with a cell phone near your bed is a really dumb idea. And even if you turn it off, and you don't have to worry about the electromagnetic waves, it's still a reminder of everything you have to deal with. It's really the repository of every challenge, every problem, every demand on your time and attention. And we need to disconnect from that. It is amazing, at least uh, in my humble opinion, the power of food, certain foods, uh, to absolutely make your brain crazy. Any, any mother of a four-year-old knows <laughs> that, uh, you know, a trip to Disneyland with simple carbohydrates, uh, you get a uh, you know, hyperactive child who suddenly then collapses screaming and crying. And you can see just immediately the power of certain foods to affect brain function. If you, is, I'm sure Thrive is incorporating that into your Absolutely. Plans. And we have incorporated um, the number one Gandhi rule, which is that uh, your health depends more on what you don't eat rather than what you eat. Because people may follow different prescriptions. I mean, they may be vegan, they may be meat eaters, but if they can stay away from sugar and simple carbohydrates and processed foods, that's already a big victory. And also, as you know, this uh, sleep movement and diet are incredibly interconnected. Like I have all the science in the sleep book that if you are sleep deprived, your body physiologically craves carbs and sugars. So it's not even a, a mental decision. <laughs> it's like physiological.
a carnivore diet is essentially a whole foods animal based diet. It includes no plant materials. So we're eating, I would argue, like our ancestors would eat. If you're in the savanna or you're in Europe and you're hunting and you kill a deer or a buffalo, carnivore diet is eating animals nose to tail. There's no plant material in a carnivore diet for the reasons that we will talk about, the plant toxins. So all of the animals, so muscle meat, organs, connective tissue, bones, brain, it also includes all animals. So fish, shellfish, you know, things like this, birds, but no plant material on a carnivore diet. When my first book came out years ago, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, which was bought by Random House, who had done all the South Beach books and all the Adkins books. And in the, in the first part of that program was actually a high protein diet. And then I, through the stages, I went more and more introducing plants, but my editor wanted me to introduce grains and beans as part two of the diet. And I said, you don't get it. Both Adkins and South Beach took away all these carbohydrates and then in, in phase one, and then they reintroduced them. And then everybody gained weight and all their symptoms came back. And what did they say to do? Oh, well, go back to phase one and eliminate all these carbohydrates again. And I said, don't you get it? It was these plant materials that they were putting back in that was causing the problem in the first place. So, I mean, the Banting diet took away carbohydrates. Um, you know, the Adkins diet took away, all of these diets took away carbohydrates. My contention is that they were taking away the major plant defense carbohydrates out of their system. And I think one of the things that you and I, just from the start, so that we remain friends is, <laughs> is, I mean, this is the ultimate elimination diet, in, in my opinion. Now, the ultimate elimination diet is stop eating, uh, which is actually very effective. But it is the ultimate elimination diet. You are getting rid of all these plant toxins. Now, this is a good step off. So you're not saying that you can go out and eat factory-raised meat, factory-raised pork, and have a wonderful time. I hope you're not saying that. No, that's not my intention to promote that. I think that the quality of the food we are eating and the ethics which with, with which the animals that we're eating are treated are very important. And so I'm an advocate for eating grass-fed, pasture-raised meats that are organic, the best meats that people can afford. And we know that things like glyphosate, you know, which is also known as Roundup and other pesticides can bioaccumulate in the food chain. And, you know, all of the ethical environmental arguments aside, we'll have to do a second podcast to talk about the environmental stuff. We know that grass-fed agriculture is actually net karma negative. There was something that came out recently with white oak pastures saying that they're reducing the amount of carbon in their environment because the soil becomes so much more rich and uh, nutrient full that it can actually sequester more carbon. So for so many reasons, the nutrition of the animals that we're eating, the lives of the animals that we're eating, and the greenhouse gas emissions, the sort of overall balance. I'm not an advocate for factory farming. I think people should be aware of the quality of the foods they're eating. I think glyphosate is a big deal. We can't ignore the fact that grain-fed animals are probably going to bioaccumulate that in the grains they're eating. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think that's one of the really scary things that we need to pay more and more and more attention to is that, you know, Roundup is sprayed on almost everything as a desiccant for harvesting. And nobody's washing this stuff off before it's fed to our animals, nor is it washed off before it's put in our bread, our cookies, our crackers, our cereals. Um, and I think 20 years from now, we'll look back and we'll holy cow, maybe all of this was a glyphosate problem, and we'll find out. At least a big portion of it is. I mean, I saw posted on social media today that in these sort of plant-based burgers, these impossible burgers, have like 11 times the amount of glyphosate of some of, you know, some of these other, you know, like other plant-based burgers. So there are certain plant-based burgers that are particularly just riddled with these pesticides. So people shouldn't think that, you know, like by eating fake meat, they're going to avoid this either. So 
No, that's true. And in fact, you know, one of the burgers I won't mention recently changed their formula to, to get rid of gluten containing foods. Imagine that a healthy plant based burger that had gluten. It's like, really? <laughs> it's, all of them. They're all bad, in my opinion. Yeah. So many of them are based on pea protein, which I think oh. you and I would probably agree would not be high on our list of uh, plant material to consume. So many lectins. No good. I totally agree with you. See, there is commonality here. What started you down this path towards the keto diet and intermittent fasting? What, what piqued your interest? Well, let me give you an example of how I changed my views. When uh, many years ago, I thought it was foolish, and that's being kind for people who were fasting. I thought clearly the evidence is obvious that you need to eat all the time. And in fact, 90% of the population, according to Sachin Panda, eats more than 12 hours a day, more than 12 hours a day. I know that's not you. I know mean, you have a one to two hour window frequently. But uh, so, you know, that most all of us are doing the same thing, believing the same. And I've changed that. And I recognize that especially as keto started coming on board and experimenting with it. And Mark Sisson taught me about metabolic flexibility. I tried it for myself and was just amazed at what it did. You've got to learn and adapt and, and really uh, modify things as you acquire new information. So the, the, the basic strategy is to become, first become metabolically flexible, which I discussed in my previous book, Fat for Fuel. That is the primary issue where, and you do that with a simple step that doesn't cost anything, saves you money and radically improves your health. What is that? Compress your eating window. When I give a lecture, I feel I succeeded if I can get that one single message to the audience. Compress your eating window. And you're a big fan of that and you have been you actually much, much before I, I understood that fact. So what's a compressed eating window? You know, 12 hours, which 90% of people aren't doing, is not enough, I think. I, 14 hours probably starts to get the benefit. And I think a sweet spot of 16 to 18. I think most of us don't have to go to your level. And, uh, you know, I think probably remember 16, I only do that six months out of the year. So, yeah. What, what was that? Two hours. And what's the, what's the, then, then you go to four hours? Yeah. Well, so in, the rest of the year, I, I go to about 16 hours. Yeah. Okay, 16 hours, that's fine. Then that's not a big deal. I'm glad because, you know, to, to do that long term, I think you're going to run into some complications because really one of the, basic tenets of the book is to is to go into these cycles which we were designed to because the human species was never designed to have access to food 24 7 just that that wasn't the case so we have to replicate that pattern if we want to maximize our biological benefits and what our what our genetics are designed for yeah no you're absolutely right as you know uh, my new book the longevity paradox also stresses exactly what you're saying we should be eating in circadian rhythms and uh, yes. there there is just utmost evidence even in looking at modern hunter gatherers that there is cyclically feeding periods and there are extended periods of time where we do not eat or we eat very minimally and so you, it's this cycle that you so eloquently talk about in keto fast is is really important and the beautiful thing about it because and you know this once you're fasting the other side benefit in addition to the mental clarity is that the hunger disappears right so as someone like you it's like you're not even doing it because you you normally if you're eating one meal that's it you just lower the calorie rate right so and then then basically you eat your next meal and you're off to the races so it's it's you don't even think about it once you once you have that restricted t window of six to eight hours uh, it becomes as easy as can be. You know, it's interesting. Uh, my my research in, 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 in Yale was on evolutionary human biology. And one of the interesting things is, and this has been confirmed, and you know, that actually when you are fasting, when you're literally starving, your performance actually increases. And the reason, evolutionary-wise, if if we were starving, we had to catch that animal. And if we didn't catch that animal, that, you know, that was curtains. Uh, yeah, that was it. And so it's fascinating that, you know, we have a built-in evolutionary advantage to perform well while fasting. It makes incredible sense.
uh, just to bring it down to what people can understand. And then, of course, when we caught that animal or we found the fruit tree or the honey tree, you know, we didn't sit there, oh, I'm only going to eat a little bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really? <Yes. laughs> so tell me about your decision to leave a brand that you helped build from the ground up and then start something totally different. I mean, what were, what were your signs that it was time to move on? Well, I was a makeup artist before I even thought of making a lipstick. I made a lipstick. I turned it into 10 lipsticks, started selling them out of my house, you know, putting them in envelopes. My husband would mail them. And after a year, I met a big, big uh, woman who worked at Bergdorf Goodman. She took the 10 lipsticks and somehow in the next four years, you know, our business was sold to Estee Lauder. So four years after I started the company, we sold it. I had two kids at the time. I now have a third. And it was just a super, super busy time. But the amazing thing was that I stayed as an employee for 22 years. I helped build that brand into a billion dollars. And anyone that has worked in any kind of corporations knows I wasn't the boss at the end of it. I wasn't able to do what I thought, what I believed in. And I just got tired of fighting. And so I said, it's time to be the boss again and do something else. So I left without knowing what I was going to do. Yeah. At 60 years old. <laughs> that, yeah, that's, uh, I, I kind of left what I, you know, was great at at, at 50 uh, without kind of knowing what I was going to do. Uh, are there any tips to know when it's time to, to move on, to, to change? Well, the only tip I have is when you're not happy, if it's not working. I mean, that's really it. If you don't come to work and excited to be at work or what you're doing is just you feel stuck. Yeah, then it's time to maybe figure out what's going to make a change. And some people do something that we call the side hustle until they're ready to make the change. And it could be, you know, who knows, you might, you know, be someone who knits and you decide you want to have a website that sells patterns and knitting things. You want to make granola, you want whatever it is. You know what? You've got to just give yourself the, the uh, you know, the opportunity to figure out what makes you happy. That's really it. What's what you're passionate about. And my favorite thing is why not? What's the worst that happens? OK, it doesn't work. I don't believe in failure. I believe that when something doesn't work out, it it's a message that says do something else. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, even my biggest failures uh, were huge successes in the things they taught me. Right, exactly. So tell me about your new wellness platform. What inspired you to go in this direction? Well, I have been a health nut uh, pretty much my whole life. Growing up in Chicago in the suburbs, I was not a health nut, I was a diet nut. Name a diet, Scarsdale diet, honey, oil, and vinegar, did everything with my mom. I was either on or off a diet. And then I realized when I moved to New York and I was working in the fashion industry, no amount of starvation was going to have me look like a supermodel. And on and off a diet is dumb. So I started to realize I feel better when I don't eat bread. I feel better when I don't eat cookies and sugar. So I started slowly transitioning. And then when I had my own company, I started teaching all the women, not just about where to put the eyeliner or where to put the blush, but if you, if you look good, if, you're, if your skin looks good, then your makeup's gonna look so much better, it's gonna be easier. So I've always kind of given back in that field and then my ninth book as I, you know, is Beauty from the Inside Out, which is a book about what you put in your body, affects your skin way more than any cream you're going to buy out there. Creams are not going to make you look healthy. And when I left Bobby Brown Cosmetics, one of the first things I did is sign up to go to school to get my degree as a health coach from Institute of Integrative Nutrition. I've been hooked on it ever since. That's fantastic. Well, as you know, your intestines are actually your skin turned inside out. And uh, everything that happens on the wall of your gut is actually reflected on your skin. 
And you're right, so beauty comes from within and it's what you uh, put in the, your system that actually will be reflected uh, out on your skin. And for someone like me who, yes, I have very good skin, I've had digestive issues my whole life. I have never been able to figure out exactly what to do. And it's another reason why I'm so excited to be part of you know, the wellness industry because I'm always searching for ways to feel better. So is that why you decided to have a line of supplements? Was that just a natural progression of what you'd learned? It was definitely, definitely. I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I'm a beauty expert. And now I'm a health coach and a health fanatic. So my line is not things that are going to change your health. They're going to help your lifestyle so you will look and feel better. Bobby, uh, you and I both, I think, agree that clean products and clean beauty is incredibly important because, you know, I talk about the seven deadly disruptors. So can you define what do you mean by clean beauty products? Well, clean beauty products are really products that don't have, you know, these additives and chemicals. And there are so many on the don't use list. There is a, a great chain of uh, beauty stores called Credo that has a list on their website that'll tell you exactly the ones, the ingredients that you should not be putting on your face. So I live by that. All my cleaning supplies in my house, my shampoos, my moisturizers, they're all clean. And I, I cannot tell you the difference. It, my house smells better and I just, it just feels so much better. Yeah, the, you know, these, most of these products have such, you know, incredible estrogen disruptors that it's actually really scary. And, you know, recently there was a study showing that a lot of the ingredients in sunscreens, which are problematic, are absorbed through our skin and can right. be detected in our blood. And that is really scary. So it is. yeah, and I agree. People have got to really concentrate on this because our skin is an absorptive surface and boy, the stuff we're putting on it is scary. So good for you. Yeah. And we have to keep making sure that companies know this and, you know, hopefully that everyone will change. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the informed consumer like you and I are, are trying our darndest will demand changes as long as they know why they need to demand this. And it's not going to ha happen from the top up. It's all got to come from below. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.